For years, horror fans have been flooding into cinemas to watch their favourite A-listers get torn apart in glorious HD, whether it be by classic psycho killers, aliens or ghosts. The brilliant thing about horror movie deaths is that they can come in all shapes and sizes. You have devastating animal deaths, something so horrid there is an entire website dedicated to pre-warning people of them, your shocking first act kills, or your so gory you have to watch through your fingers mutilations. There are ones you spend all movie crossing your fingers never come, and then on the opposite end, there are the deaths you spend the whole time wishing for. Don't lie, it's fine, we've all done it. I'm Jess from What Culture, and here are the 10 horror movie deaths you were totally rooting for. Number 10, The School Bullies, Carrie. This first entry is pretty self-explanatory. Not only is the story of Carrie so well known at this point, it also follows all the classic beats of a woman scorned story. If you've ever been bullied, you have at some point wished for them to get their comeuppance. And while hopefully you don't mean death by that, that is the beauty of film. These people aren't real, so you're allowed to relish in the deaths of these caricatures, right? And when you think of a typical school bully, you probably think of the bully archetype that the movie Carrie made popular. Pretty, cool, popular girls that are dating beautiful men and look down on the rest of their peers. Carrie's one of these vulnerable peers. She's quiet and strange looking, her mum is a devout Christian who's infamous in the town as being crazy, and she's completely sheltered from the experience her schoolmates are going through. So when Carrie starts her period in the middle of a school day with no idea of what's happening, the school bullies are immediately enthusiastic about ridiculing the girl for her naivety. Little did those bullies know that this particular day would mark the start of Carrie's telekinetic powers. But Carrie doesn't use her powers to make them pay. Yet. It's not until the night of her prom on stage in front of her entire year covered in pig's blood that it's finally time to make those bullies pay. And boy, do they pay. Number 9. David, Shaun of the Dead Okay, before going on the offensive about a certain Shaun of the Dead character, it has to be said that the titular Shaun is not the most relatable narrator nor is he the best guy in the world. He's lazy, unmotivated, and seems doomed to stay a child forever. So it makes sense that Sean's ex-girlfriend's friends wouldn't like him. That said, we're currently in a zombie apocalypse, so you think maybe you could just let bygones be bygones. But that's not David's style though, and that's why when watching Shaun of the Dead, David's death scene is so bloody satisfying. David is nothing but dead weight to Sean and his crew, and that's saying something. He's whiny, argumentative, selfish, and sleazy. He's so clearly in love with another man's girlfriend whilst having a girlfriend himself. He's also completely tactless when Sean's mum is dying from a zombie bite, arguing with them all and saying they need to kill the kind old woman. I mean, we we're all thinking it, but still, not cool, dude. But filmmaker Edgar Wright certainly knew what he was doing whilst making this slime ball of a character, because due to how much we did not like him, we happened to get one of the most brutal and excellent death scenes. When David is pulled through the pub windows by zombies and has his stomach ripped apart by the horde, you can practically hear the smug smile on Wright's face. That is, if you're not too busy cheering. Number 8. Wendell, The Belko Experiment If you've ever watched a movie or TV show based in an office, you'd have deduced that there's always an intolerable sleazeball employee. Of course, on a normal workday, you'd probably still not go so far as to root for their death. But when the office is put into lockdown and a mysterious voice says that all employees must fight to the death, Boy, does that sleazeball come to mind. But Wendell from the Belko experiment is not only a pervert, don't let him catch you calling him that, he's also a bloodthirsty maniac. You see, unlike most of the other employees on the day Belko Industries decides to go all evil corporation, Wendell immediately goes gung-ho for murder. For the first act of the movie, he's your typical unsavory employee, and for the second act, he shows how spineless he truly is when he hides behind his CEO and encourages him to commit executions of employees for the greater good. But the third act truly sets Wendell up as the movie's secondary antagonist, as it's announced that it is now every man for himself leading Wendell to take a bloody meat cleaver to his so-called peers. Brutally, he hacks his way through so many innocent people, and while yes, many other employees are doing the same, there's something about how much Wendell seems to enjoy his massacre. You do know, though, that his brutal death is inevitable, and when it does finally arrive, ah, you just can't help but cheer. Number 7. Franklin, The Texas Chainsaw Massacre Now, there's nothing inherently evil about Franklin, unlike a lot of the characters on this list. 
But boy oh boy does his death bring out the most cathartic feeling a horror movie can. It's unfortunate that such a famous horror movie chose to make their disabled character so intolerable, but seeing as it was made in the 70s, are we really surprised? As previously stated, the reason for Franklin garnering such an impassioned response wasn't due to any inherent evilness, but purely down to him being the most annoying character of all time. He was the epitome of a whiny man baby, from loudly telling stories right in people's faces to blowing raspberries like a child, from screaming at the top of his lungs for not getting his way, to rolling around the floor like a character in a Laurel and Hardy movie. Everything about Franklin is just designed to piss you off. Don't feel bad about it, it just is what it is. Moviegoers sit on the edge of their seat during their first watch of the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, not because of fear, but because they're quite literally pulling out their hair praying for his inevitable demise. Number 6. The Later Masses. Ready or not. There's nothing more satisfying than being proven right. That is, unless your head is getting blown off at the same time. At least audiences still got to enjoy it though. You see, Ready or Not pits Everyman Grace against her lethal in-laws in a terrifying game of hide and seek. Grace's husband had left out some crucial information when proposing, namely that his entire family worship a devil-like being they believe to be behind the family's wealth and business success. They also believe that a wedding night ritual, a game of some sort, must be played if they want to continue to be on the good side of said being, even if the game chosen is the deadly hide and seek. Which, unfortunately for our hero Grace, is the one chosen on the night of their wedding. The whole movie is spent with the characters and the audience going back and forth on whether the deal with the devil is real. The family are constantly fighting about whether or not they will die at dawn if they cannot sacrifice the surprisingly capable Grace in time. The family is privileged, psychotic, and completely unsympathetic, so you know, we're waiting for them to die. So imagine the disappointment of viewers when dawn comes without a sacrifice and the family are somehow still living. But the disappointment didn't last long, because as the family decide they're still gonna kill Grace anyway, heads start to roll or, well, explode. The crescendo of violence is so fitting, so satisfying, and so earned that all we can do as an audience is laugh along with our final girl. Number five, Officer Nick Good, Fear Street Trilogy. The Fear Street trilogy completely took Netflix and the world by storm this summer with its brand new format for a movie series and its retro style. Although the three movies all tell different parts of the same story, not many of the characters featured in all three films, either because they were slashed out of the story or because of the jumps in time. Besides our main pair of siblings, Dina and Josh, the most prominent character was Officer Nick Good. Good was presented as the morally straight cop that seemed to have our main character's interests at heart, only to be revealed as the true villain during the final act of the third movie. Only trouble was, even before that final reveal, audiences actually despised this good cop. They found him self-righteous and unhelpful, even during the flashbacks of him as a more laid-back teen. So after watching three whole movies of good back-to-back -back over three consecutive Fridays, audiences were ready for him to die. Perhaps that's why the final return to 1994 is held as the best part of the series for a lot of people, as we get to watch an entire plan play out in an attempt to finally kill the criminal cop. When Dina finally manages to overpower and murder the greasy traitor, we were rising out of our seats in glee. Number 4. Mrs. Carmody, The Mist Ah, the angry preacher, an apocalypse movie staple since the dawn of time. A character so high up on their own soapbox, a brutal fall is practically inevitable. Mrs. Carmody from Stephen King's book The Mist and its movie adaptation is the perfect example of this trope. When David and his son Billy head to the local grocery store the morning after a big storm, neither of them know just how long they're going to be there. When you go to a grocery store, you don't usually pay any mind to the diverse characters wandering around the aisles with you. But when you're forced to lock yourself in said store because a mysterious monster bearing mist has encompassed your town, you start to pay attention to the people around you. Mrs. Carmody is exactly the kind of character you wouldn't notice was around until you're stuck with her for a period of time. The woman, an extreme religious fanatic, is an insufferable preacher spouting nonsense about the end times. But as time wears on, so does she. 
She slowly sheds her sheep's clothing to reveal the evil and psychotic wolf underneath. From shoving her religion down people's throats to literally trying to sacrifice a child to the monsters. Her behaviour was a perfect way to intensify the claustrophobia of the situation for the audience. But the movie delivers this so well that all you can do is plead for the characters to chuck her into the mist. Number 3. Jonah Hill This Is The End When it was originally revealed that Seth Rogen's This Is The End would feature a bunch of frat pack members playing escalated versions of their actual personalities, we could never have expected just how escalated they were going to be. Yes, you had Rogen as your typical lazy stoner, James Franco as an obnoxious actor, and Danny McBride as a sociopathic version of himself, but the most startlingly hilarious role came in the shape of Mr. Jonah Hill. While we all know that Hill is considered a very down-to-earth, hard-working Hollywood A-lister, the movie paints him as anything but. The Jonah Hill of this universe is a fake nice guy, full of passive-aggressive behaviour and snide remarks. He's painted as the kind of guy who's just had all that fame go completely to his head and thinks he's better than everyone around him. Hill perfectly plays the grade A narcissist and succeeds in not only aggravating his close-knit apocalypse surviving frenemies, but movie watchers too. His selfish and self-centred behaviour slowly grates on you until he's eventually seen praying one night for his supposed buddy Jay to die. Thankfully, the demons that now roam the world don't take too kindly to this behaviour and possess him in the middle of the night. After a hilariously terrible attempt by the others to exorcise Hill, he accidentally gets set alight by a candle and we finally get to watch the douchebag die. Number 2. Dawn, 28 Weeks Later No matter how much the English may love themselves some Robert Carlyle, there really is something to be said about the pure detestability of his character Don in the zombie flick 28 Weeks Later. The movie begins with Don and his wife Alice hiding out from the infected when suddenly a scared young boy comes knocking at the door. After a disagreement, the couple let the boy in, only to realise he's led a group of zombies right to them. Alice, ever the mother, refuses to escape without the boy in tow, and so Don, despite trying to get his wife to come along, just straight up leaves her. She then gets dragged away by the monsters. Audiences were enraged that Don not only made it to safety, but also seemingly was being set up as the movie's protagonist. But not to worry, Don gets his dues when Alice is brought to the safe haven, having seemingly avoided being infected. What Don doesn't realise when spinelessly asking for his wife's forgiveness is that she is indeed carrying the rage virus. And when he kisses her on the lips, Don unknowingly infects himself, setting into motion the movie's action. The audience is forced to watch as Don's selfish actions caused the complete destruction of what was supposed to be a safe haven. So when the fatal bullet is shot into zombie Don, there's a ton of catharsis for the audience who gets to see this guy get his just desserts. Number 1. Jill Roberts, Scream 4 when Scream 4 came out 11 years after what was supposed to be the third and final film in the franchise, audiences were mostly unimpressed. Thankfully, over the years, fans have learned to appreciate the movie for the gory and campy romp that it is. While the gore was certainly a standout for this particular entry in the franchise, it was the final act that cemented it for its quality. Scream 4 attempts to introduce you to a whole new cast of teens, with Sydney's timid cousin Jill at the forefront of the group. Jill was perfectly positioned to be the new final girl, until it's shockingly revealed that she was the mastermind behind the new Woodsboro Massacre. It's at this point in the movie that we're treated to the movie's best sequence, as the once fragile and innocent Jill murders her ex-boyfriend, her accomplice and her cousin Sydney. She then gets to work creating the crime scene, stabbing herself, throwing herself into a glass table and ripping out chunks of her hair. The audience then are begrudgingly forced to be impressed with her seemingly getting away with her crimes. But we soon find out she isn't the only survivor, because Sydney, ever the final girl, didn't die. What follows is a longer than necessary sequence of Sydney and her team versus Jill as they try to kill what seems to be an unkillable killer. By the time Sydney lays down next to Jill's body, we as an audience are in a stress haze yelling at our TVs, just die already. Which she does. And that's our list. Do let me know down in that comment section which horror movie deaths you've personally been rooting for because we'd love to hear about them. As always, I've been Jess from What Culture. Thank you so much for hanging out with me. If you like, you can come say hi to me on my Twitter account where I'm at Jess McDonald. But make sure you stay tuned to us here for plenty more horror goodness.